Get ready to rock. Welcome to our GRTR at 20 podcast series. Ten years after Marillion's formation in 1979, they had a brand new singer, Steve Hogarth, and in 2007, we caught up with Steve to chat about the then new album, Somewhere Else. I think it's true to say, Steve, that every Marillion album is different and there's a sense of anticipation with every new release. Uh, what do you think's influenced the new album? Um, it seems terribly laid back to me. Laid back? Do you think so? Yeah. Um, it's got a vibe going in it, hasn't it? I, I don't know how you describe it, but um, how, did it, how did the writing process start for somewhere else? Well, the same as all the others, to be honest. I mean, very little difference in the process. Um, we um, we get we get together um, we get together in our own studio here out in Buckinghamshire, uh, and we jam each day for four or four hours or so, which is about as much as we can stand. And um, we we just try and, and 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 get some chemistry going. I I I usually show up with um, sometimes entire lyrics or or just half formed lyrics or sometimes just streams of consciousness and I have all of that up on the laptop screen um, and uh, the band jams and I try and I try and go where the jams take me and, and sing whichever lyrics I think will work um, while the band's jamming and that generally produces a lot of rubbish uh, <laughs> but occasionally you, you get a happy accident and um you know, we we record the jams, and then we usually just a stereo, and then we sit down and listen to them. And and anything interesting that happens, um, we'll we'll use that then as a building block uh, for a song. And the only really the, the criterion really uh, is is that it it should be something that that excites us, even if we don't know why, and um, it should be something we haven't done before. Mm. Um, we we we're keen to try and avoid making the same record twice, um, and so we're constantly looking for for some accident or other that is like n- no accident we've had before, and um, and that they're the building blocks of the songs. Also, with with this album, we had we had Mike Hunter in the room with us and he was seizing on the happy accidents too and snipping them out and uh, running off to Liverpool and coming back a few weeks later with a a few of his ideas Um, and that was all going in the pot and then we sat down together and spent a long time arranging the songs but um, I think you know we've 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 got something uh, we've got a good one here I think would you say that it maintains a certain vibe? I mean, you sound a little bit surprised there, really, but you've got the up-tempo, typical sort of Marillion songs, which we, we sort of come to expect, but then there is this mellow vibe, I think, which um, you find on a, a few of the tracks, really. Were, were you conscious of that as you were doing it? Um, no, it doesn't strike me as particularly mellow, to be honest. <laughs> when, uh, the opening track, the other half, isn't terribly mellow, and I see it like a baby... It's groovy, but I it's suppose perhaps groovy is the, the 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 term that's you know, more yeah, accurate. Really, I know what you mean. It's yeah. got a nice spirit to it. Yeah, um, a voice from the past is very is very different. A bit dreamy in places. But, but, oh yeah. But you've always been like that in your vocal style, really. And would I be right in saying that um, the vocals has become more of a focus for Marillion, really? I mean, we joke actually on the website, um, Steve, that. Um, since Steve Rothery seems to have dropped his chorus pedal out of the, the frame, that things have changed slightly, really, because that was a very distinctive sound he had, wasn't it, with the guitar? Yeah, I think um, he made a decision round about the time of the strange engine to redefine his sound. Mm-hmm. And I admire him for that, because it, it would have been so easy for him to stay in that comfort zone with that big, echoey, creamy uh, lead guitar sound and, and the really clean, glassy sort of um, 
Roland chorus combo kind of sound. Uh, and I think he just got bored with it. You know, he felt like he'd been there and done that. And and ever since he's been he's been delving into other sonic possibilities with the guitar. And uh, to great, you know, to great effect as well. I, th I think his playing on this album is is wonderful. He's more turned on these days by by subtleties. He's, he, he, I don't think he feels that that he has to blow some big rock solo whenever he can crowbar one in. And, and mm -hmm. I think uh, Steve's sensitive enough as a musician anyway to to respond to the song rather than just feel there's something that he has to do he responds musically to to the mood of each song and, and it means that his contributions are i guess as times past have become more subtle but in many ways much more refined um and i mean my my favorite piece of guitar playing on this entire album is probably something that i would have to point out to you my favourite bit of guitar playing on the whole of this record um, is during the title track, Somewhere Else, um, where I sing, um, Everyone I Love Lives Somewhere Else, and I Have Time to Look at Myself, just before the big drum fill comes back in. There's a bit of distorted guitar that, that just bubbles under that line, and it's magic, and I would have paid 15 <laughs> quid. I shall listen out for that again now. <laughs> Oh, now, now, look, one of the things, Steve, um, you know, when you get an advance listen to this album, of course, we haven't got the lyrics in front of us. Could you just tell us about some of the tracks from a lyrical point of view? Because I know you're very strong on that. Is there any theme that runs through any, any or all of these tracks? There's, there's not a theme running through all of them, but there's, it can probably be broadly split into two or three themes. Um, my marriage hit the wall just before we started writing this record. Um, uh, in, we started um, at the beginning of January last year, and in the December of '05, just before that, um, me and my wife uh, parted company, mm. and uh, my life went into a period of chaos and turmoil. And, uh, but also, I think when a relationship fails, it usually fails a long time before you actually call it a day. Mm. And the point at which you split up, in, in, in a strange way, although it's, it's, it panics you and it's painful, um, it's also a time when, when new possibilities open up to you. You suddenly see the possibility of a shaft of light, you know, and <laughs> a future, a different kind of future. And so you suddenly feel quite free. It's a strange combination of emotions. And um, so um, the, the title track somewhere else was, I wrote that lyric on Christmas night in 2005, literally within days of being um, asked to leave. And um, so that's, that's really where that came from. Um, also, there, there's um, the opening song, the other half is about uh, my new girlfriend who I, I met two or three months later uh, so we were still writing and uh, and uh, I, I found a new soulmate and I wanted to celebrate that and then the other half is about that so there, there are love songs of sort of pain and joy in this but then there are also um there's also a couple of songs that are more to do with the state of the world. Um, a Voice from the Past was really a lyric that that, that was born out of the work we, we did over the last couple of years with Make Poverty History and my increasing awareness of the obscene statistics of, of, um, of poverty in the world. Um, and so I felt it was high time I wrote that down, I wrote what I felt about that down, and uh, made my feelings public. So A Voice From The Past is really about that. Mm. And The Last Century For Man, again, is, is, is not a love song. It's, 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 that's been born out of American and therefore UK foreign policy over the last few years, and the, the war with Iraq. Um, 
and the state of the world in general, this um, hedonistic rush towards um, what remains of the Earth's resources. Mm, mm. And what's about most toys? Well, that's that just a simple comment on 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 capitalism mm. and materialism. Really, mm. again, mm. you know that that this, this um, the the importance of self and um, you are what you own, um, and or to put it another way, in the, the old cliche, you can't take it with you. He who dies with the most toys is still dead. Mm. Mm. I think that does ring out, actually, even without the lyric sheet in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. um, and it's also the shortest song we've, we've ever recorded, I think, of 2 minutes 47. It is, that's right. Am I right in saying that you don't really go out to make a commercial record, if you can call it that, really, nowadays? I can honestly tell you we don't give a damn. No, uh, no. We, we want, we're probably one of the few bands on earth who are under no commercial pressure at all no. um, to make this kind of music or that kind of music to have a hit single um, to to fulfill a certain marketplace in, within a certain genre we're, we're totally unselfconscious about the genre we fit or don't fit into um, we're blissfully ignorant of the marketplace and um, we do make this music for ourselves and then once it's done and we release it, we cross our fingers and hope to God someone likes it. But but there's no um, premeditation whatsoever well, that, that's, in the direction of the record. It's really fascinating, because I suppose you can do that really with your own label, and it's very much a, a grassroots thing that's grown and grown, hasn't it, with, with, with your own label and, and, the, and the fan base and everything. But um, so would you say then you just go with the flow? Whenever you come together for an album, you just I think you start off by saying, uh, you know, very much you... You know, you'll bring pieces to the to the table, but um, you'll jam out tracks and just see what transpires, really. Yeah, that's exactly how we work. I mean, lyrically, I think the songs are always going to be reflections of of what's going on in my heart and mind um, mm. at that point in time. Yeah. That you know that those words are being written. Um, they're truths. Um, there's we're, we're not one of those bands who sit around going, OK, what would sound like a good line in here? We don't work that way. We work the other way around where the words are, are true things that are written down and then um, after the fact I, I attempt to find a musical home for mm -hmm. those words. But the words are actually the boss, if you know what I mean. The words are in charge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't mess too much with the words to make them fit. I mean, obviously, I fine-tune lyrics once the songs are arranged and they're in a shape, but um, um, the words tend to be first, and the music is jammed, and so we never know where we're going with it. Yeah. And we never have the faintest idea what kind of an album we're making <laughs> until we've made it. In fact, with this one, we we ended up with six or seven more songs than we we could fit on the album, so we have six or seven recorded and mixed on the shelf, ready to go for the next one. And, and they're really strong songs too. They're mm. not poor relations. No, we no. have to make some really tough decisions about what to leave. What, what will happen to those, Steve? You know, in terms They'll of. They'll be the next album, and, and yeah. then I can promise you, we'll we'll be coming with another record uh, this time next year oh that's great the first time in my career <laughs> I can actually make that promise because it's nearly all there so we're going to try and um, write and record two more songs this year at some point and uh, then we'll we'll take the others down off the shelf we'll listen to all of it and we'll decide what to use and we'll still have too much so oh, we'll what's a nice position to be in really are, are, are these extra songs complementary to somewhere else or did they just not fit this particular album uh, I suppose what I'm asking really can we expect more of the same groovy vibe that I try and describe to you earlier <laughs> or are they, are they a bit different really I think I think they are different and that's why we didn't put them yes. on this album yeah um and I also think that once they're in the context uh, 
once they're in the context of 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 uh, of being in amongst whatever we write this year, they'll feel even more removed from it too. Yes, but then that's all part of the Marillion thing, isn't it? That there's no one album really the same. Well, I'd yeah. like to think not. You know, mm. I mean, sometimes people say to me they don't hear a great change in you know and they've, I've, I've been and done interviews and people have sat down next to me in the past and said well I don't really hear any great change between this record and the last one and that always depresses me mm. to hear someone say that mm. I mean nine times out of ten it's because they haven't really given it a good enough listen a good listen that's right I mean there's always going to be you know I can't get away from my voice I open my mouth and what comes out is my voice so you can't get out of your own skin, so you you can only change so much from one album to another. But I like to feel that within the parameters of of being the five human beings that we are, we change. You know, we try to to grow and change and push the envelope as much as we can. And we rounded off the interview in March 2007 by asking Steve if there was anything else he wanted to achieve in terms of his musical career I still feel like you know there there may be um, an amazing an amazing song left in me somewhere you know um, and so it's really just a case of striving striving for that it's as, it's as simple as that it's just a desire to explore and improve and maybe one day you know, write the ultimate song that's only in my head. It actually worries me that I'm so happy at the moment. You know. <laughs> From a creative point of view, personally, domestically, privately, and, and, and of course professionally, because of all five of us are feeling good about this record and particularly good about the fact that we haven't got such a steep hill to climb for the next one, which is, which is going to enable us to to relax and, 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 and really enjoy this tour this year. Uh, OK, uh, final question for you, Steve. Uh, going back through some 20 years of recording with Marillion, what are your uh, particular favourite albums, or maybe your favourite album, uh, and why is that? The two that stick out for me are, are Brave and Afraid of Sunlight. Uh, they, they feel like important important album. Afraid of Sunlight I think is my favourite although I think Brave by its nature is it's dark and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of Marbles as well I think those three um, but that might be just because I've listened to them more recently and um, whenever I go back to any of them I'm I'm uh, you know, I'm going to sound immodest, but I am really pleasantly surprised when I go back to them. They're always better records than than I remember them. But it's terrible being a singer because you've always got to you've always got to listen to the sound of your own bloody voice. You know, and I've often thought, you know, if anyone else in the world had sang on this song, I'd probably much prefer it. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a drag to have to listen to your own voice. It's like staring at yourself in the mirror, you know, you'd much rather look at someone else, really. Thanks very much for all this, Steve, and, and best wishes to you and the band with the album. And hopefully it'll, it'll pull in a wider audience, because I think it's very accessible. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, we'll cross our fingers. Ah, oh, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure. I want you.